Welcome everyone to another edition of Unravel Your Mind, where we are all about transforming relationships to love and life and breaking through beliefs to tap into our inner wisdom. So we're going to jump right in and see if there's any callers on the line that have any question questions. And we also have our chat going. So feel free to, to call in or to write a question in the chat. Anyone have a question? Okay, well, the live callers uh, get on the line. I'll ask one from the comments section. It says, I so connected to your trials you have gone through in your relationships, um, thinking me too. What helped you get through the point of forgiveness of them and yourself? And is this an ongoing process? So that's a great question because I think um, forgiveness is something that's so important for all relationships. And and in some ways, I think I took forgiveness maybe a little too far. If we think about the sleeping with the devil chapter, there's some interesting times when uh, I kept going back and in, in hopes of having a, a conscious uncoupling with someone who was spiritually unconscious and uh, hoping for that forgiveness and, and that that place where we could both leave the relationship and feel like we really, where we really were able to, to separate our life cords and move on in our lives. And that clearly wasn't the right person to do that with. So um, I think forgiveness can be a really interesting topic. I think forgiveness is, um, is one that we need to always work on. And I do think to the question that it is an ongoing process. Sometimes we can close that up and, and forgive the person. And sometimes we need to forgive ourselves. So it's, it can be a, a little bit tricky to figure out which one we need to forgive. I think as we know, relationships are ongoing and so, so is forgiveness. So, any other questions from the, um, the live callers? Oh, we have a comment, what a journey with Klaus. Yes, referring to sleeping with the devil. Um, of course, that was a very, I think most people needed a stiff drink after that chapter. <laughs> and, and I have forgiven him. And I think for any of you who have read the book, I hope that you read the gratitude notes in the back because I also write a note uh, to Klaus um, thanking him for everything that I was able to learn. And I, I genuinely feel that. And I also feel really compelled to have shared that story as in many ways, it could be very embarrassing for me. I felt it was a story that needed to be shared because a lot of people have situations that they get themselves in where, where they are being, um, yeah, where they're being disillusioned by a sociopath or a narcissist and they come with really good open hearts and find themselves in difficult situations. So I wrote that and I wrote the details of that knowing that I could actually be um, thought of as stupid. Um, and yet I knew that there's so many others that, that probably need to hear the message, but most importantly, I want them to know that they can also get out of these types of relationships. All right. Is there any other live callers that have a question? Yeah. When you, when you say you forgive, yeah. um, we all know what that means in its, you know, in its defining moments. But are you defining the, the, for the health of yourself? Are you truly forgiving everything that's going on? Like, are you trying to make sure that it all leaves leaves your your little universe, or are you forgiving to help your you build strength in yourself? Um, I think both. I mean, I think I think the energy of forgiveness when you forgive yourself and when you forgive someone else, and you don't hold a grudge or you don't hold grief or you don't hold the emotion around whatever they, you know, whatever they've caused you, whether it's a Klaus or um, my ex-husband or, or a situation with a friend, um, the energy of forgiveness and, and transforming that into love. It's not saying that we agree necessarily with what someone has done to us, but we're giving back the energy that we're not going to be in the suffering of it anymore and that we're turning it over to love. And so I think that it's, it's, it's both, but it's, it's very important for me to have that energy within myself that I'm, that I'm not holding on to something that's not serving me. And then, you know, to answer your question even more, then it goes out to that person and to all the parties involved. And we give back to them what it is that, that is theirs and not, not ours. So that's the process for me with, with forgiveness. It's something that, you know, really 
came clear to me. Um, you would think maybe from my religious background, growing up Christian, but I actually have to say that that I learned more about forgiveness uh, studying A Course in Miracles and seeing what that actually looks like and and feels like. And so that's been a, a real stable um, a stable doctrine for me to refer to. Of Course in Miracles. Yeah. Any other questions from the the live callers? Not yet. Okay, let me see. I've got a couple more coming in on the chat. It seems in your stories, when you just can't take something anymore, you take the leap towards a new way or future. How did and do you trust that inner voice or guide? Now, I'm not sure which story they're referring to because I feel like some of my stories, um, I, I did not uh, trust my inner voice and guide initially, and that's what got me into those situations. Um, I, I was relying on on my my projection of what I wanted to believe that person um, was or could be, and we often fall in love with people's potential. Um, so depending upon which story, I think I might answer the question differently, but um, yeah, taking a leap towards a new way or future. Uh, I think the other thing that comes to mind is to say that I, Spirit's always giving us a nudge. Spirit's always speaking to us. Our intuition is always here telling us something. And it often comes to us in our body. We can we can feel something. Um, it might be what I like to call a drop-in where I actually just get a drop-in, an idea, um, guidance. And I think that um, we ignore them a lot of times. And so there's times in my life where I've waited until I was on my knees and had to make the leap. Um, what I work hard on today is to not have to get to that place where I feel like I have to get hit over the head by my angels and guides and higher self um, and get the get the hint before that so that I can make the leaps in advance to keep moving forward as opposed to stay stuck in something and wait, whether it's a career or a relationship. Um, yeah, that I can that I can start to tune in more more closely to my inner wisdom and know what it is that's right for me, and then make decisions based on that so that I'm not at a place where I have to make such drastic, drastic decisions and jumps. So I hope that answers their question there. Um, I'll ask a question and, and forgive me because uh, I don't have the book in front of me right now, but I was curious if during any of your psychedelic journeys, um, the, the theme of forgiveness was something that came up or um, of guides coming in to help. Um, if you wanted to speak to that. Yeah, I, uh, as you asked that question, I didn't get anything that came to me about forgiveness that I recall. Um, however, I feel that on psychedelic journeys, you're, you're able to see things from such a, a loving place that it almost skips forgiveness. I don't know, that's just what is what comes to me. I don't even know if that makes sense to, to everyone, but I mean that you, you just see so clearly that you just know that there's actually nothing to forgive because you just go back to that perfect wholeness and you see the other people in their perfect wholeness and you also see their wounds and you see where they're coming from. Again, it doesn't necessarily mean that you agree with it or that you are in support of their actions or their behaviors, but, but you go back and you see their inner child um, oftentimes in a psychedelic journey. And so I think for me, there was, there's been a lot of encounters that I've had with, with people in my life um, that came to me in journeys. Um, and it was, yeah, very, very clear, some of the messages. And, and I think one of the messages that, that I got that I kind of will take as a, as a more broad reaching message was that everyone has free will. And so when it comes to other people and relationships, a lot of times we want to help them, we want to heal them. And it's not our role. Our role is not to heal anyone in this lifetime. Our role is to know that we're perfect and whole and that that they're we're here to shine the light and show the way. So we can, you know, walk with our brothers and sisters home, but we're not here to heal them. And we have to allow them to do their journey and for them to follow their soul's guide and learn their lessons and allow them to really exercise their free will. And so that was actually a, a bit of a tough message for me. It came in, in a couple of different relationships. Um, and I realized how much I, I wanted to, with, with a really big heart, to help someone and realize that it's their journey and it's their soul contract and that I, ne I really needed to let them 
live theirs and not interfere with it, which I think is very challenging a lot of times, especially when it comes to children um, or people that are incredibly close to us. I did get um, a lot of messages from spirits, but as I said, I feel like I didn't necessarily feel a um, forgiveness because it almost was like, it was like beyond forgiveness um, in my journeys. Great question though. Uh, let's see, I've got another one coming in on the chat. It says, have you heard of Combo? I did it to help heal. And the guy I worked with said it chases herpes right out of you. Uh, question mark, question mark, question mark. I do not know. I have not done Combo. Um, so I do not know. Uh, I, I know of Combo. I do not know the healing effects of it. I don't know anything as it relates to herpes. I think that a lot of the, the medicines can help with viruses. I know at least for me, uh, San Pedro, I, I give it 100% credit for helping me fix my digestive system. Um, I was having a lot of issues uh, with my microbiome and my own natural ecosystem. And, uh, and I, I just absolutely swear by San Pedro. I did not go into a San Pedro ceremony, even asking for a healing with my digestive system. But at the time I had been diagnosed with a very severe form of, of, um, bacteria in your gut, um, gastrointestinal doctor said I needed to take like four different antibiotics in order to get rid of this H. pylori is the name of the bacteria. And, um, and I really didn't want to do that to my, to my system to take that many, that many antibiotics at the same time. And so I happened to have done the San Pedro ceremony, um, after the diagnosis, but before I had started the regimen. And once I was done with the San Pedro ceremony, I just had this feeling that that was cleared. And I asked my doctor to, to do another test to see if I had cleared it. And I had in fact cleared it. And she was like, this is almost impossible because nothing clears this virus. So, um, and I feel like I've had a huge transformation since then. So I wouldn't doubt that, um, that these medicines can help with a lot of viruses. Um, I also just had, and you can find this on my YouTube channel at Beth Bell Live, uh, a, a video that I've talked with um, a homeopathic doctor, an herbalist um, who puts together tinctures for people. And he's, he swears that there is no cure. Um, I, I think that there, there is a cure in, in a couple of ways, actually. Um, he does have some remedies that, that he talks about in that video. So if you're interested in some of the remedies, please go to that video. Um, and I'll put the link in the, in the comments below here as well. Um, but I also believe that it's a virus of the mind. And I think that when we can get beyond the ideas of, the, of what herpes brings, which is shame, guilt, vulnerability, uh, that we can we can blow up the mind virus. That it that it really that's really what has a hold on us more than the virus itself. Because if we were sick with uh, any other virus, um, what would people do? They would they would bring us soup and they would take care of us. They wouldn't ostracize us and make us feel like lepers. And so I think the more we can break the barriers of of this idea that herpes is some terrible thing and really just move beyond all of these ideas that we can we can just live a much happier life and not have this shame and guilt that that's held so tightly by by society as a whole and one of the other reasons why i really wanted to talk about it in the book is that i was writing the book um you know during the covid times and i and i realized how much virus shame there was around COVID when we were in the thick of it. In the beginning, people wanted to shame people for, oh, you weren't wearing a mask or, oh, you didn't get a vaccination or you did get a vaccination or whatever it was, or, oh, you went into a public place or, oh, you traveled. And people were just shaming people left and right about COVID and they didn't want to tell anybody they had COVID. And so I was like, people are going to understand whether you have herpes or not. Um, you're going to understand what virus shame feels like. And if you don't have herpes, your chances are you will be in contact with someone who does. And uh, yeah, the sexologist, which is another interview that I did that you'll be able to find on the YouTube channel. Uh, we also talked about the prevalence and, and how, how I think it's 60%, if not more of the population. I know it's 450 million um, have herpes, and that is probably just the ones that are actually reported. So um, it's a virus that many, many, many people carry. And so it, it doesn't have to have this shame and this stigma um, that the society has, has put around it. And so I really am here to shine the light on that and just 
show the way that we don't have to sit in shame around herpes. So, and most importantly, to work through the trauma of how we've how we've contracted herpes, because that becomes very challenging if if people don't actually release the trauma around the whole situation, not just the virus itself. So, to have a hundred percent full cure, I I believe in it. Um, but again, I think that the mind cure is, is the mind virus is the, the best one to cure because if you can get beyond all of the stigma and the ideas, uh, because you also are creating an environment for herpes to, to be in your body if you, if you hold the energy around it as well. So, um, yeah, I think that people will find that once they move through and heal the mind virus part of it. They won't see the virus uh, show up in their system, but I don't know how many people are actually getting tested to see after doing different things, if they're actually clear of the virus or not. I, I don't know that people are, are looking to get negative tests or, or not. So yeah. That'd be think, a clinical trial. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah, so I hope I answered her question. Um, on the chat about combo, um, I'll I'll ask around and see if I can provide more insight on on that and see what combo does for um, if it does help with viruses, then it, it might also help with long COVID and and some other viruses that you know shingles and things that people are dealing with that are very um, devastating and who knows maybe even uh, HIV AIDS. So let's see. I'm not making that claim. I'm just saying, <laughs> we'll we'll see if there's any research or data that might support that. Um, let's see if there's any other questions. Any other live callers have another question? So I I assume the the journey to 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 not just write the book but to publish the book and to expose the book to the, to all the readers. Um, that had its own challenges. If you were going to do, and I'm sure you're going to write more than one book, but if you're going to write another book again, did you um, learn something not just, you know, from yourself on, on writing this book and how you would do things a little bit differently? You know, not just what you've learned in the book, but the actual the process of it. Um, the process of writing the book, would I do something differently? Um, you know, this particular book was so divinely guided um, that I just followed spirit and flow with it. And I didn't actually do probably anything of what all the experts would say to do when you write a book. Um, I, I did have an outline in the beginning. Um, spirit just channeled 12 chapters that ended up being 22. Uh, I wrote chapters in out of order. I wrote them in whichever order they came to me. And so that probably is also something that someone um, wouldn't necessarily recommend. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't intentionally try to make a flow. I really just felt like my, my role in writing the book was to capture the elements of my awakening journey. And that probably the hardest part for me in writing the book was that knowing what I know now, it was hard to go back and write some of the stuff in the beginning and not want to say, but I know better now because I really wanted to write it from the perspective perspective I was at then. Like, for example, I, you know, I really had no interest in tarot cards. I looked at them as like Ouija board and who wants to, you know, who wants to communicate with spirits on the other side and who are we talking to anyway? And so, um, so in the very beginning, that was a big deal for me to have that tarot card reading in Australia. And then of course, for it to completely change my life, um, thinking that I wasn't going back to my corporate job and then having the card reading be so clear about everything that was going on in my life um, and giving me guidance. And so, you know, now I'm a big, I'm a big fan of, of card readings and, and whether it's angel cards or tarot cards or ancestral cards. Um, yeah. So, so I think that was probably one of the hardest things was just to go back to where I was. Um, moving forward, I don't know that I would do anything differently. Um, I guess I, I am starting my, my next book. I've, I'm already kind of deep into it. And, uh, and I get a lot of, I get a lot of my higher self saying, and write about this and write about this. And so it's a little bit, um, frustrating for me in the sense that I'm still very much immersed in, in this book and getting this message out. And so, um, so I'm, I, I don't want to say ignoring, I'm just not able to get my pen to the paper to write fast enough um, what's coming for this next book. But I also feel like um, that I'm writing this next book 
because I am closing out some really important chapters in my awakening journey. And so, yeah, so I feel like each book will probably take on a little bit different process um, because I'm following spirit and maybe I should be more diligent to follow a process that's tried and true, but I feel like this is, this is what's worked for me. I think this, this next book, I'll do a lot more, uh, a lot more deeper reflection as I go through the book. Whereas I feel like this first book was, I, I had done so much deep reflection as I went along the journey, that a lot of it was just archiving and, and, and sharing the stories that had happened. So, um, yeah. So I think, you know, when we write books, it's, it's all about where we are in our own energy and, and what feels, yeah, what feels right for us. So it's a little bit different also writing a memoir, writing about personal stories than it is about, you know, writing that, that wisdom book or, you know, the five tools, the, you know, 10 tips or whatever. So yeah, the process might just be different as a whole with something like memoirs or, yeah. For those who are watching that are on their own or beginning their spiritual journeys, I think sometimes it can be helpful to know what kind of practices people do regularly to connect with spirit. Um, and I'm, you know, in light of all the different things that you were exposed to, you just mentioned like, oh, I never would have used tarot cards or angel, you know, angel deck or anything like that. Like, I wonder if you could speak to some of your routines, your spiritual hygiene, if you will. Um, yeah. That I'd like to. Yeah. Well, yes, no, I love that question. And um, I have a confession to make that, that some of the things that I know are the best for me, I, I haven't been doing. And so uh, I recently took a trip back to Costa Rica and went back to where I was um, in the book and did yoga and Kundalini yoga and breath work. And I was like, oh, I know these things. I know I should be more in the body. Um, and so I'm incorporating more of that again. Um, I've also picked up A Course in Miracles again, more recently, um, wanting to dive back into the lessons. And then there's that big M word that is always, it feels like it's always haunting me. And the M word is meditation. Um, as you know, from the book, I, the flowers really taught me how to quiet the mind and how to just be present. And so, and access my higher self. And I feel like with everything that's going on, I mean, I know some of it's my personal stuff. I know some of it's just the dynamic of what's happening in the world right now and the energy that's happening. Um, quieting the mind is, is some days really challenging and it does require us to sit with legs crossed, you know, upward spine, breathing in, tucked chin and really just hunkering in to who we are inside and connecting to source and staying grounded to this earth plane so that we can be in this world and not of it. So meditation has um, now become an everyday occurrence for me. I've just really sat myself down and I'm actually part of a, a meditation group. And I highly recommend that because that keeps us all accountable to show up at the same time every day for that 30 minutes. And then we have a Dharma talk afterwards. So for anyone who's not, uh, a, a meditator quite yet, um, sign up for a group. It's the best way to get yourself into the groove, but also recognize that there's lots of ways we can meditate. I mean, I think surfers are good meditators and flower whispers are good meditators. So there might be a, a painting might be a good way for you to meditate. There might be a lot of different ways that you can go about it. Um, but sitting quietly is certainly, certainly one of them. Um, one of the other ones that came to mind when you were asking that question uh, that I, I haven't been doing um, since Bali, but I will say that it was one, one of the modalities that I absolutely loved was family constellation work. I would volunteer twice a week and I would go and sit in the knowing field and participate in other people's family constellations. And the reason why I love that so much and the reason why I miss that so much is that it's such an incredible opportunity to, to feel and channel emotions within your body because they're not yours. So you're not stopping yourself from feeling something. You're just allowing yourself to feel whatever's coming through. And I just felt like that always heightened my sense of my own emotions so that when I was not in a family constellation, I was, I was able to feel within my body more. And I feel like I'm not doing that as much these days. Um, 
So I really, I really miss that component. And that's something that I would highly encourage people to get involved in is a routine of, of attending family constellation work, even as a volunteer, even as a participant, maybe not someone who's having the constellation done for them. Um, yeah, so that's another one that I would say, but there's a bunch in the book and there are even more tips, tools, modalities in the Awakening and Healing Handbook. I describe in more detail a lot of the, the different things that I talk about in the book, but I go into a, more detail as to what the you know methodology is. Um, and I, I also give uh, recommendations for, for healers, um, for all the different types of modalities that I talk about in the book. So the Awakening and Healing Handbook can be found on bethbell.me. And uh, yeah, that's also a really great resource to help people decide what is right for, you know, for my routine, because um, everybody's routine, you know, will probably be slightly different. And so those are the ones that I rely on. Do you write from memory or as you're experiencing these events? Um, uh, the first book, Angels, Herpes, and Psychedelics, I would say that um, I wrote, I wrote from memory. Um, but what was interesting is I wrote from memory as though I was in the experience. I really felt like I was back in that energy as I wrote. Um, yeah. So I was not technically experiencing those events in my current time. Uh, but I felt like I was because I could, I could feel myself back into those emotions and into those places where, yeah, where I, I could feel viscerally how I felt in those moments. And so, um, I also felt that that was spirit guiding me to, to really put a transmission into the words that I wrote and into the stories that I wrote so that they actually had the emotion in there as well. Because while I wrote the book about my stories, obviously, and it's my life, I wrote it because I wanted other people to have a, a way to, to, to really revisit some of the things that, that they've also dealt with. I mean, I think I cover so many different things in, in the book, and I know that people have come back and said, oh, that happened to me, and oh, that, when you talked about this, and this really helped me, and, and, and that's what warms my heart. Not so much that everybody knows all my stories, because that's, that's, you know, it's personal and it's vulnerable, but it's, it's more my heart sings when I know people feel like it's, it's nudged them to maybe dig a little bit deeper into their own journey and help them to maybe open a box that they've had closed for a while, and now that they see that, oh, maybe there's a way that I can, you know, work through that and not just numb it or stuff it. So, yeah, so I kind of digressed a little bit. I know from the question of, is it from your memory or from experiences? And I think this next book that I'm writing, um, some of it, I'm still in the experience. I'm still, I'm still, uh, yeah, really just fine tuning, but, but I think um, for the most part, it's still coming from, from memory. And, uh, and then we get to some places where we go, oh yeah, okay, that's where the bow goes on the box. Um, so sometimes that comes out in the, in the process of writing too. Yeah, oh, someone's reminding me here on the chat that um, for family constellation work, you can also participate on Zoom. Uh, yeah, I know there's a lot. And again, in my, in my Awakening and Healing Handbook, I have um, very, very well uh, known practitioners of, of family constellation. You'll see Gary Stewart in there. Um, I might have another individual in there as well, but I know Gary's in there and he's been doing this for many, many years. So please um, check out the Awakening and Healing Handbook and, and it gives you links for, for everyone. And I can put some links down below in the chat here too. So if anyone's interested in family constellation that they can certainly participate over Zoom. So you don't have to find, uh, yeah, find a, a facility or a place that's doing them. So, uh, and it works just as well. I've, I've done it via Zoom and I've done it in the actual room. So um, I can, I can uh, recommend that for sure. Let's see. The other one was um, from, actually from yesterday and I wanted to address it because we didn't get to it yesterday. It was, and it was asking me, about um, being a solopreneur. And I feel like I wanna see if I can find the actual question. Uh, okay, so the question here is, what are you discovering about being a solopreneur now in your life? 
don't do it. <laughs> no, I just mean being a solopreneur is really super hard. And I think that having a group, um, being part of a mastermind is so important because being a solopreneur is very challenging. Uh, but the, the beauty of being a solopreneur or an entrepreneur. Um, so first of all, I would say, you know, have a group, don't do it on your own. Um, doesn't have to be business partners, but it can be people that you're, you've hired, um, people that are there to support you. Super helpful. Um, there's been many times that I feel like I wasn't able to, to collect that support. And that was really, really hard. But the beautiful thing about being an entrepreneur and a solopreneur is you learn so much about yourself and your spiritual awakening journey is heightened because there is nowhere to hide. Um, all of your strengths and weaknesses come up full force in front of you. And you are faced with having to really look at everything because it's you, it's your business and it's, it's your output, it's your ideas, it's your vision. And so that brings, that brings a lot, um, a lot to the spiritual journey and really gets people into this interreflective space to understand a lot more about who they are as a person and what they're attracting, what they're not attracting. And if it's, you know, and eat with ease and grace, or if it's not, and I've had both situations where I've been in ease and grace and everything's just in absolute flow. And I've had it where it's been so darn sticky that it's just like drives me nuts. And I don't know if I can do it another day. So, uh, being an entrepreneur is not for the faint of heart. It's, um, certainly for the brave and courageous people who, who really have a intrinsic desire to, to do something. Hopefully it's uh, in your passion and purpose and not just uh, driven for money because that makes it really hard to keep going when you're in the toughest spots. And I think for me, um, I've, I've really always felt that I'm, I'm doing my passion and purpose and that uh, all of my projects and businesses have been aligned with pollinating the planet with love. So with that intrinsic desire, it's always driving me to keep going and to keep going and to make a difference and to help humanity, you know, awaken um, to expanded states of consciousness and for all of us to get beyond the chaos that our, you know, our minds want us to believe is reality when it's, it's just an illusion and, you know, we are the creator of our lives. So yeah, th that's a good question about being a solopreneur. It's a, it's a tough road at times, um, but it can also be very rewarding. And I think it accelerates your spiritual plan and builds your, certainly builds your spiritual toolbox. That's for sure. Any other questions from the live callers? So you growing up, growing up where you did, <clears throat> you know, in North Dakota, um, do you ever think about the aspect of if you would have grown up in LA or New York, um, the growth you had from the youth to the adult versus the adult to the new or the, you know, the, the Beth who you are now, that's sort of like two different journeys, wouldn't you say? Um, in other words, in other words, if you would have, let's say you were born and raised in LA, you may, um, have either learned some of these lessons earlier, or it might have taken longer because you were exposed to much more of the world. Yeah. Um, well, yes. I, I I just feel like everything was so divinely guided. I mean, we we I believe we come into these these lifetimes with with our our soul contracts and some 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 of the major touch points. Um, you know, who who we choose as our parents, where we come in. You know, where we're where we where we are born, um, all of those factors play a role in, in the foundation that we looked to build and all of the things that we decided we were going to get programmed with, uh, you know, up until we're about seven or eight years old. And then, uh, and then we spend a lot of our life, you know, just attracting all those things to confirm all of those limiting beliefs about ourselves. And then at some point, most people wake up either through an accident, illness, uh, heartbreak, big love and say, Oh, wait, there's something more here. And then they start peeling back all the layers of the onion and they start unraveling the mind in a way that they can see who they really are at the core. So yeah, I think that, um, my life has changed dramatically from where I grew up and, and everything that was happening that at that point in my life, but it was all just so 
intricately designed and and well put together by my higher self before even coming in. So yeah, does that answer the question though? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, there was also one other one other uh, comment in a, in the chat. I don't know if there's a caller that could that wants to uh, just clarify this, but it says. Your descriptions are like notes for a movie director. Was there any more, or was there a question, or was that just a comment? Uh, no. well, it, it was, you know, being a fan of cinema, I just love the way you write. I feel like I was on, in a movie, in your movie, the way you describe it, and like I was in India, and all the details you put in is just incredible. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I really... I really wanted to speak from my heart and, and share. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that that, that came through. Um, yeah. So, well, I'm still hoping that maybe there's going to be a Netflix series or something. So, but maybe I've written it so well, we don't need one. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Anybody have any last uh, comments, questions, thoughts that I think will... We'll wrap it up and I appreciate everyone calling in, everyone texting and chatting. And if you're watching this in replay, um, you can always find more videos and come to the live YouTube uh, events. Um, just subscribe and hit the bell and you'll get notifications of when all of these events are taking place uh, at Beth Bell Live on YouTube. So I look forward to seeing you all again very soon.